Hello! Today, we're going to look at the fine-tuning argument for God's existence, and I'll also throw in a surprising plot twist at the end. Now, I think the best way to present the intricacies of this argument is to explain a naive version of the argument, and then go back and delve deeper into the complexities that the naive version glossed over. The crux of the fine-tuning argument is that there are physical constants that show up in the equations of physics whose values are not necessitated by those equations. We can imagine a universe with different constants, and there's no logical contradiction as far as we can see. However, smart scientist people discovered that if these constants were only slightly different, and I mean different by a tiny amount, then no life would be able to exist. For example, changing the constant slightly might lead to the universe imploding in on itself right after the Big Bang, before life could even have a chance to exist. Okay, so now we could turn this into an argument for theism. Theism predicts that God would make a universe capable of supporting life, because life seems like a good thing. So the probability of getting a combination of constants that allow for the existence of life is high given theism. On the other hand, Nothing within the tenets of naturalism would lead us to expect any particular combination of constants rather than another. And if we laid out every possible combination of physical constants, only a tiny subsection of them would allow for life. So, only a tiny subsection of the naturalistic probability space would predict that life is possible. With the probability space fleshed out, we look around and notice that our universe can support life, and we scribble stretch based on that. Because the probability of a life-permitting universe was super tiny given naturalism, this argument is going to be super duper strong. Now, that's the naive version of the fine-tuning argument. But there's a bunch of factors that complicate the way I've drawn out the probability space here. We should be going over the complicating factors on the theism side of the probability space in future videos, so let's just look at the naturalism side here. The first point I want to go over is that some people suggest that the constants had to have the specific values that they do have, necessarily. So, the reasoning goes, we can't use them in a Bayesian argument. Now, I think this is mistaken. As I've previously discussed, we can actually use probabilistic and Bayesian reasoning on things that actually had to be the way they are, such as the digits of pi. For example, there's a probability of 1 in 10 that the Googleth digit of pi is 7. So. Let's move on to a more formidable objection. The fine-tuning argument is scribble-stretching based on facts about what happens when we vary the constants in the physics equations that describe our universe. However, the argument doesn't even consider what happens if we change the equations themselves. But those smart scientist people haven't explored all possible physics equations, they've just kept the equations fixed and explored a bunch of different combinations of constants. And the set of all possible physics equations is going to be massive. So really, we don't have a good grasp on what the probability space looks like on the naturalism side. The vast majority of it is simply uncharted. But it gets worse. You see, the question of whether or not a combination of constants allows for the existence of life is actually super difficult. Imagine we find that varying a particular constant makes all chemistry impossible. That would certainly render all life on Earth impossible, but would that render all physical life impossible? As a thought experiment, it's at least imaginable that you could have some sort of science fiction energy beings that still exist even if molecules and chemicals are completely impossible. Of course, we have no idea what sort of physics would make such life possible, or even if such life is possible. But there's no clear way to rule out such exotic forms of life. When we're looking at some combination of physical constants, it's hard to say this combination makes life impossible, because maybe some form of life could still exist in that universe, and humans just lack the imagination to realize it. And with this consideration, our knowledge of what the naturalistic probability space looks like is now even darker. There's this sort of fog that covers most of the naturalist probability space. Maybe if we uncovered it, we'd find that Life-permitting universes are super rare, and the fine-tuning argument works great. Or maybe we'd find that life-permitting universes are super common, and the fine-tuning argument is terrible. But we just can't uncover the fog. Now, I don't think that this obliterates the fine-tuning argument. Even if it turns out that we don't have as much data as we'd like, we can at the very least try to extrapolate from the data we do have. 
See, we still have the fact that human life could easily be rendered impossible by slightly varying the constants in our equations. No one, to my knowledge, disputes that fact. And this hints at a reason to think that, actually, if we uncovered the fog on the naturalist probability space, we'd find that life is indeed super rare. See, I'm no physicist, but my understanding is that the reason that the fine-tuning for human life is so delicate is that there's a bunch of balancing acts going on between different extremes. For example, if the expansion of the universe was slightly faster, then stars wouldn't form. But if it was slightly slower, then the universe would collapse in on itself. Stuff like that. And the interesting thing is, we actually see this sort of thing going on elsewhere, like in Conway's Game of Life. Conway's Game of Life is a simulation of a two-dimensional universe, so to speak, with a grid of squares that turn on or off, depending on the number of squares around them that are on or off. Now, in Conway's Game of Life, you can build some pretty cool stuff, like you could build a computer in it and run any program. Now, interestingly, there are actually constants built into the rules of the game, and you could simulate what happens when you change them. And what you find is that nothing really interesting happens if you change the constants. You only get interesting behavior when the rules that promote squares turning on and the rules that promote squares turning off balance each other out in a really precise way. So looking at all this, I have a hunch that for any system of equations with constants built in that allow for life, there's going to be some delicate balancing act going on. You're not going to find some set of equations that allow for life no matter what the constants are, because you'll always be on the verge of falling into some sort of extreme. That would mean that life would require fine-tuning, no matter what equations obtain, and no matter what kind of life form existed. Now, this hunch is a very, very big extrapolation on just a bit of data. But if you think that there's some modest probability that my hunch is correct, for example, let's be generous and say that it has a 20% chance of being true, then we can run an argument based off of that. We could say that, in the theism section of the probability space, the chance of fine-tuning is really high, close to 100%. In the naturalism probability space, 80% is covered in fog, and we don't know what's really going on in there, so we'll ignore that for now and worry about scribble stretching there when the fog is uncovered. But in this section of the probability space here, squared's hunch is true, and life is very rare. So, when we scribble stretch based on the existence of life, the probability of theism will still go up. So that's my preferred formulation of the fine-tuning argument. What score do I give it? Well, get ready for that plot twist I mentioned. I give it a score of 1. That's equivalent to saying that this argument provides no evidence whatsoever for the existence of God. The reason I give it this score is because there's one more objection to the fine-tuning argument that I failed to mention. It's called the electrons in love objection. And I believe this objection does obliterate the fine-tuning argument. But it simultaneously generates another argument for theism. And this, this argument, in my opinion, is literally the strongest argument for theism that has ever been made. So we'll be looking at that argument, along with the electrons in love objection, in the next video. See you there!